So th- it was it was a proud moment for you, huh? Oh yeah, yeah, right. Like she went through, did the task, nailed the pal- parallel parking, which is like. That's all I really cared about. You could have failed the rest of the test, but you're going to know how to parallel park, period. <laughs> well, it looks like we've got people coming in here. So Ian and I were chatting about uh, some fun joys of parenting and teenage drivers or even older yeah. kid driving that we were talking. So um, meeting Ian tomorrow in Chicago with his family. My kids and I are headed up to Chicago. We're all spending the weekend together, hanging out, watching NASCAR, doing fun shit, having a good time. Um, (laughs) Somebody just said adult kids are the worst. You know, it depends, you know. So Ian, you've never done a webinar with me before, but this is kind of like the typical MO of how we roll. Like it just, there's just shenanigans that start before it gets serious and how we're gonna get things going. But yeah, it's, I don't know if adult kids are the worst. I'm going to be honest. Like I will say that um, teenage girls and, and with no disrespect to women out there, anything like that, you know, cause I obviously I've got girls and I've got a son and my son is not a teenager yet, but I'm just going to say, Oh, Jen Larson, here we go. Um, teenage girls can be rough. Like it just, it's <laughs> tough it, it, and not in the driving aspect of it. Cause I've never experienced, but so my youngest daughter, Madeline, who is, 15 trying to get her learner's permit uh, failed it the first time because in the state of virginia in the signs component of it if you miss one road sign they fail you which i think is crap personally but you know whatever it's it is what it is and so we're back at it tomorrow right before we go to the airport to fly off to chicago and you know her comment to me this morning was well what if i fail it tomorrow and it's like well madeline we've got two options and it's like you're winning or you're learning and that's what we're doing tomorrow. So you're going to walk out there and feel like a winner, or you're going to walk out of there and feel like you've learned something. Either way, I'm going to love you the same. It's going to be great. And we're going to get on the plane. We're going to have a great weekend in Chicago, hang out with some people, apparently eat like the biggest banana split thing that ever existed in the face of the earth. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, lots of things it's going a bad on. Decision. It's, it's just all a bad about decision. bad life decisions, apparently. About bad life decisions. Yeah, I'm just going to encourage everyone who's attending to like, if your normal shenanigans level is here with Mr. Crane, I want you to raise it up to where these pictures above my head are, because I never take myself seriously, and you damn well shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kerry Wagner is already starting on me, and he said he does. He always tells me to take it down. Come on, Lisa, that's not always true. What I'll tell you, like Lisa is like one of the coolest people that I've met very recently has just started working for us, but Lisa doesn't know how to shut her work brain off. Like we're, it's <laughs> eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night. We're standing around. It's been a long day. And Lisa wants to talk about all of these ideas that are running through her head. Like she can't shut. I'm like, Lisa, can you just like, we're good. Like we can just not be the work. <laughs> nope. That's not Lisa. Lisa just goes and goes and goes. <clears throat> Or Michael get rapid fire from me occasionally. All right, so what are we at? We're just at about three minutes after. We've got a couple more people rolling in. We'll give it probably two more. Well, we'll give it one more minute. We'll get this started at five after. Um, for those of you, well, everybody probably has some idea of who I might be. Um, but for those of you that have not met Ian Richardson, Ian and I had the opportunity that we met last year for the first time, and we got to work together a little bit on the Matt Lee charity fundraising, shave the beard thing, and I just found this really cool, interesting man that was out there talking about things and, um, you know, found a good friend, first and foremost, you know, found somebody that I felt like I could connect with. Not a whole lot of people in life that I probably even want to try to connect with. So you made the you made the initial cut. So I'm gonna say that's you know, sorry, Ian, you're kind of screwed for the rest <laughs> of your life now. Um, but more importantly, like just in talking and sharing ideas and hearing some of his aspects on especially leadership and this talk that we're about to get into today. Hope we make the cut. I don't know what. Oh man, Enrique wants to make the cut as well. <laughs> um, 
but Ian had this really cool talk that we started collaborating with a few months ago about mission, vision, and value. And then I got to see him do it last, was it last week or two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago. Two Two weeks weeks ago ago. at a conference with Jennifer Bleem down in Orlando, Florida. And I was like, man, I can't wait to go ahead and do this now for our community and our partners. So we've got the infamous Ian Richardson joining us here today to, uh, you know, bring some knowledge. This is true. This is true. Cool. So uh, I'll, I'll do the, uh, you know what, I will, I'm going to do the cardinal sin of a webinar and I'm going to bring up some slides, folks. And the reason why is that they definitely will help me remember what the hell I'm supposed to be talking about, if nothing else. But I'm not going to sit here and read slides with a bunch of words at everyone. And uh, again, yeah, I know. No, no, that's right. Thumbs down. I want you to rate this the worst webinar that you've ever gone on. Okay. Worst, like one out of one, like zero out of five stars. That's what I want. There you go. Boo. Boom. Someone throw a tomato at me through now, the screen. It'll somebody's work. already saying it looks like you're <laughs> laying in bed and I don't know. I mean, knowing who nope. that comment came from, all I'm going to say is we'd probably need to leave that one alone. <laughs> nope. Nope. All right. Hang on. Where are we? This, this, this. There we go. All right. Let me share this out. Everybody see the screen okay? Even if not, it doesn't really matter because I'm just using this. But if you notice, there's like 17 pages here, okay? And and most of them are are basic stuff. So we're going to talk about uh, mission, vision, values. Uh, I like to call this a hat trick. It really, really is for those of you hockey fans, right? Score three goals. Um, That's what this is all about. Who am I? I'm Ian. Uh, I founded an MSP a couple years back. I ran it for about 16 years, sold it in 21. Joined uh, the awesome Carrie Simpson, aka Carrie Richardson, over at Managed Sales Pros to help package that up, sold that. And then both her and I dove into Richardson and Richardson, which team of two, to do consulting and talk about cool things like strategy and distractions. And distractions is really the, uh, the key theme of this talk. So I don't think, can someone throw something in the chat? I don't know if it'll bubble up on presenting or not. I'm saying so, it just yeah. fine. Yeah, so it'll be uh, it'll be on Michael to to throw out or whatever with with questions and stuff. But definitely questions, thoughts, tomatoes, whatever you guys want to do as we go through. But I want to run through for comedic value. I'm already going to tell you it's already started. And somebody said this presentation must be good because he's used his name twice for the company name. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it is it is really really good. It's like uh, so interesting aside when we when we started R and R. The brand, we, um, we, we do a lot of branding work with folks, but I'm a big fan of eating my own dog food. So we brought in someone to facilitate us through branding. And what dropped out of the Richardson and Richardson brand is breaking every single marketing rule on the planet. You're not building a company brand. It's like, no, this brand is you and Carrie. That's it. So it's just going to be your faces. You're going to use yourselves as all your own stock photography. All you do is just talk about yourself. And the company is almost this... Uh, invisible player in it as long as you two are larger than life the company brand works so it's really cool because we just get to go fantastic places and wear ridiculous outfits and take photos while we do it and that gets to be the brand it's it's fun so i highly recommend that once you build like a real business and sell that just do this secondary consulting thing and and make shit up the whole time uh, uh oops sorry hopefully we're not broadcasting like facebook live or something yeah even if we were i wouldn't care it's okay I said it earlier. I already I broke the seal. We're good. There we go. Cool. So on this slide, key thing, we exist to change the world by helping entrepreneurs realize and achieve their vision. I'm going to swing back to this. There's a reason why I threw the, our mission statement right at the top of the deck. And we'll, we'll swing back over to it. But before we dive into this, some fast definitions. Mission, vision, core values. It's really important that everyone on the call has the same vernacular. So you don't have to adopt my definitions on these by any means, but it's useful if you do and you want to adopt this tool set. Mission is all around why do we exist? 
And so circling back to that initial slide, we exist to change the world by helping entrepreneurs realize and achieve their vision. What's each word mean in the sentence? Defining out a mission statement that's clear, that's actionable, that can motivate and inspire, and, and most importantly, align a team in a direction forward is a really, really, really key piece of strategic planning 101. So change that action word. Hey, it exists in one way. We're trying to impact it. We're trying to change the world as a scoping statement. Helping entrepreneurs is what we do with our target. Realize and achieve is what our target will do after they work with us. Vision is the goal. So this mission statement, those big words there, Richardson Richardson is going to change the world. We're going to do that by helping entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs are going to realize and achieve their vision. So those of you who are story brand fans, this is already using some of those concepts all the way right at the top of that funnel the top of the decision-making tool set in the mission statement, we're making our targets the hero and we're just supporting them up. So vision, vision I always divide into three columns. This comes uh, from Tom Patterson. I'm definitely not gonna take credit on how I craft a vision statement, Tom and, uh, and the Stratop methodology does this, but start off with where you're at today, the good, the bad, the ugly, Go ahead and expose the warts. It's great if, you're, if your current state and your vision statement says, hey, here's things that aren't necessarily ideal, as well as things that are really going well or, or clicking along at a good pace. Where are we going to be headed? I don't recommend doing 10-year vision statements. That's too far in the future. A couple years out, usually three, is a great target because it's, it's close enough that people can see it. And I'm a big fan of, of making your vision stretch, but not super wide off screen, right? So your, your team should be able to see a bit of a stretch when it comes to vision, financially, strategically, operationally, but it shouldn't be so wide out that they go, that's, that's impossible for us to achieve in three years. So an achievable vision. And then the how is just, these are the things we're identifying that we got to do to get there. And your how list almost becomes that motivational scratch off list, right? Like when you do something out of your how list, you should be strike throughing it on your vision statement and say, hey, we've, we've done this, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. And every quarter or six months, however long you're, you're taking to do that cadence of updating, you should be pulling out that how list and saying, look at all the stuff we've done. So. Mission, actionable, aligns your team. It's a public facing type of statement. Weaponize it, throw it on the back of a t-shirt. Vision statement, much more prescriptive as to where you're at, where you're headed, how you're gonna get there. And you should be using that internally during communication. Core values, like who are you? What do you hire and fire to? What are you today? Not what do you wanna be? Um, make sure that you're not falling into the trap of those permission to play values. So I work with a, with a company out of Wisconsin, and they have some core values that are dangerously around permission to play, like loyalty and integrity. But when you hear the story of what makes up that core value, it changes the game, right? One of, one of the things that really sticks out to me about that uh, organization, I, lo I love the story, even though it's a uh, kind of steeped in tragedy. They had a, they had a partner, a, a founder who got cancer and passed away very, very young. And uh, that, that value of integrity uh, around the team is exemplified by them sharing the story of that, of that partner who is gone and how it was handled when that, when that disease was discovered, when they kind of ran through how, what are we going to do? How are we going to make sure that we take care of them all the way through the course of the disease to, to its unfortunate end for that individual? And, and the value, his name was Dave, and the value that they, that they defined is what would Dave do? And that's the value of integrity. And they use that story, which is steeped in a, in a negative outcome. Obviously, someone passed away to really exemplify this is what we will do in all situations. So 
make sure that those values are, are who you are and, and what you have, have good stories that you can use around them. But again, mission, why you exist, vision, where you're at, where you're going, how you're gonna get there, core values, who are you? All in the same playbook. I know I went fast there. So. Hey Ian, I've got one, got one yeah. question that came in and it was from Preston and Preston says, can you elaborate on the permission to play? So a permission to play value, is, um, my favorite one is honesty or integrity. Those are, those are two values that'll usually hit a core value sheet that are almost permission to play. Look, I'm gonna tell you by coming over to ABC Carco, we are gonna lie to your face. We are gonna steal money. We are gonna sell you a lemon. It is awesome. You wanna buy that car, here's where you sign, right? Like everybody's lining up out the door to go over to ABC Carco, right? You're not gonna do business with a company or wanna be part of a company that is dishonest or, or lacks integrity or is, you know, cheaters and thieves. So if you're gonna have honesty as a core value, you need to be able to make sure that it's more than a lip service or a permission to play value. It's, it's you're in danger of diluting the strategic value of a core value statement by doing something that should be like table stakes. So we're all in the IT field here, patching, patch management, that's kind of a permission to play. That's a table stakes item in your managed service agreement, right? You won't spend a huge amount of time if you're trying to wedge on the fact that you can manage patching for someone you were doing it wrong. Um, sorry if I just made someone really <laughs> feel bad on this call. <laughs> I, I'm glad. I'm no. I'm, I don't think you're making anybody feel bad. And if you do, maybe it's just a gut check that they needed, because unfortunately, sometimes we get trapped in those ideas of, you know, hey. I am doing this. Well, okay, you're supposed to. It's like, I go to my surgeon and I know my surgeon is supposed to cut on me. That is what he is supposed to do. So if he tells me, hey, one of the things I'm really great at is cutting people open and putting them back together. Well, damn, I hope so. Kind of your job. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I'm glad to hear that as the guy who's got the little X on my abdomen here or whatever. My favorite thing about surgeons is when they're working on one half of the body, they'll straight up come in and draw an X on the spot. And it's like, you know what? Smart. I appreciate you. Make sure you circle it, underline it, whatever you got to do to make sure that you know that you're over here and not over here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good with them setting themselves up for success. That's right. So we've got those in there. Why am I hammering home? on these because the hat trick above all else is about eliminating what I really like to describe as business cancer. And I just, I just did a story around there, but there is straight up cancer in organizations that spreads. It is insidious. Anyone who knows anything about this disease, cancer has a tendency to metastasize which all that means is it, it spreads somewhere else. So you, it might start off in your liver and then it goes to your lungs. It might start off on your skin and then it goes inside somewhere into your bloodstream or into your lymph nodes, any number of things. And when cancer metastasizes, it is way, way more difficult to cut out, to get out. Sometimes they got to blast your whole body with radiation. Sometimes it's chemotherapy. Sometimes it's surgery. Sometimes it's all three. But it's really, really tough to get cancer that spreads. And distractions in a business spread like cancer. One of the worst types of distraction is the interruption. And I'm, I'm straight up talking about when that help desk tech when your project engineer, when your admin assistant comes up and interrupts you, like, hey boss, I just need to, you know, you got five minutes, you got a quick second. Yeah, sure, what's going on? And they run a situation by you and you help them solve that situation and then they leave. And you go, shit, where was I? <laughs> and then you gotta dive back in and you gotta get stuff going again. On average, there's some crazy scary math on this, but this is, not statistically verified. I haven't gone out and taken surveys of thousands of people. So before someone wants to rake me over the coals, look, this is just my spot in the sandbox. But 
when I looked back at my MSB and tracked, because we were really, really good at entering time, even this guy was really good at entering time, went back, ran some reports out of the PSA. On average, myself and my team of leaders were interrupted about three to five times every day. For years, we were interrupted three to five times every day. At R&R, sometimes by the other Richardson, I will get interrupted 30 to 50 times a day. But I hope she's nowhere to near you at the moment. Oh, no, she's out. So I can Good. get away with this. You nobody, a, you... nobody rat me out here. All right. <laughs> the first person who rats me out, I will find you. I'm just going to be like Liam Neeson. I will hunt you down. <laughs> so, no, like, seriously, interruptions happen with the clients and the prospects I talk to when we dive into this and they look at their own data, same number holds. So, on average, I'm predicting that you and anyone in a leadership or management position at your company is probably getting interrupted three to five times throughout their workday. Those interruptions tend to take about five minutes to handle, so five minutes to deal with the conversation, and about five minutes to get back into it to 10 and 10, depending on the day. So it might take you between 10 minutes and 20 minutes to get back into your groove. When you do the math across things, you are losing five to 17 days of productivity for your leaders per year, per leader. Five to 17 days of productivity time just in the shredder, dealing with what might be important. It might be escalations or client service or management or whatever. It's fallen into that urgent bucket instead of the important bucket, because things that are important are rarely urgent and things that are urgent are rarely important. And so distraction hits your desk as the owner, leader, whatever, CEO. It hits your operator's desk, your integrator's desk. It hits your manager's desk. And it even hits the peer desk down at the bottom of the pyramid because help desk tech A and help desk tech B might be interrupting and going back and forth on, hey, how should we handle this? And you are bleeding time in your company when you look at this. Whenever you look at a collaborative effort that wasn't a scheduled or an important collaborative effort, an ad hoc stand-up collaborative effort, that is an interruption. And so what can you do about those interruptions? How can we kill this cancer that is bleeding time? And that is the hat trick. So what you can do is you can create a decision-making process for your team that empowers everyone down to a onboarded help desk tech all the way up to make what I consider a good decision. What's a good decision? Does it honor our mission? Is it in alignment with why we exist? That's the top of a funnel filter. It should be pretty easy. So I have a, I have a client who has a mission that's, that's a bit prescriptive. We exist to guide and protect our clients through technology as they pursue their vision. Through technology, that's the prescriptive part on here. So the, it's an IT company, great mission statement. Boss, I think we should go open a janitorial services division, <laughs> right? Like we're gonna clean, not only are we gonna protect our client, we're gonna clean their shit up too, right? Like, okay, does this align with our mission? No. Maybe we shouldn't do that, right? Not at, at least not at this company. Maybe you form a different company and you want to go into janitorial services. Great, but not at the IT company. After you go through the mission, is it going to further progress on your vision? So huge wide funnel up here. Wow, did it get narrow when it comes to vision statement. If it's not on that how list, you got to be able to describe how does this decision help us move from where we're at today to where we wanna be. The vision statement is your shiny object filter. This is where you get to kill all the shiny object distractions. Look, great idea, awesome idea. It's not necessarily in the three-year plan. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna write down that idea. We're just gonna open up this little drawer here. We're gonna stick it right here. We're gonna shut that, we'll, we'll bring it out later. And maybe we can accommodate it later. But if you have a shiny object problem, your vision statement can save you from yourself. Core values are the, like the, this is the, the, the Michael Crean filter right here, right? If it is violating 
core values? The answer is no, right? You should never make a decision that is misaligned with core values. You should never be doing that, right? If, if you have that core value of honesty and we're trying to tell a, a little white lie, well, is that honest? If we're trying to do a decision where it's a, hey, you know what, we're gonna avoid this conversation. One of the core values at R&R &R is awkward conversations. We're gonna, we're gonna have the chat. We're gonna tell truth to power. We're gonna get into people's faces and say like, this is not okay. You're screwing this up and here's how, even if it's, even if it's uncomfortable, we're going to go have those conversations. And so kicking the can on a difficult conversation is never allowed. Sorry, I got to go have the chat, even if it's awkward, even if it makes the room uncomfortable. Sorry, have to go do that. So core values becomes that third filter that you can do. And if something is honoring your mission, if it's furthering progress on your vision and it's in alignment with core values, how could that possibly be a bad decision for your team to make? So what you do is practice this at your level, get comfortable making decisions with it, move it down to the management level, get them comfortable making decisions and you've suddenly erased the majority of interruptions going to you. Get your managers to train your team on it. How could it be bad if your help desk tech, who has their guidelines around their role, right? I'm not saying ignore job roles, but they're saying, okay, what should I do for this customer? This customer has a problem. This customer is upset. Does it honor mission? Is it going to further progress on vision? Is it aligned with core values? Well, I'm going to like make my judgment call based off of how I've been trained, based off of a process. And they do that and maybe there was a slightly better decision and that's okay. And you can have that in a review and a post-mortem, but it was still a good decision that that person made. You pair this with budget making authorities for your managers and they say, you know what, just write off that work or you know, just go out there and do it. Even if we got to go out there post hours, whatever it is, because it aligns with where you're at, they don't have to mother may I over and over and over again, your team can start pushing through. As I mentioned, shiny objects don't vision, honor vision progress. So there's some, there's some people from Solutions Granted on, on this call, right? One this decision-making filter goes both ways. When's the last time that Michael came in with a shiny object? Anyone got one? See what I'm doing here? I'm just poking my friend. Oh man, I got, man, I'm going to get embarrassed here. I mean, I've already had one of my sales guys come in in this and say, when you were talking about one of the statements earlier and said, you know, that cams and salespeople never interrupt. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> never, never, never. That, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't happen. Salespeople never want to run. Like, you know what? I just had this, I had this weird idea about account A. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. God, what, what do you think? Could we do this just once? Uh-huh. <laughs> do you think if we, if we went right. outside, if, if we went outside and did this custom scope, that'd be okay, right? <laughs> I got it. So one of my employees, Jennifer Larson, just said sales equals 911. Oh, 100%. It's absolutely an emergency all the time. There's no way we're going to win this bid if we don't do this. All right, well, I guess we won't win that bid then. <laughs> so if you, got, if you have shiny object syndrome either bubbling up or being dropped down, this should be the pushback. Like, hey, Michael, uh, you know, that's a great idea. You always have great ideas because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a little brown nosy here, right here. But uh I'm just, I'm, I'm confused. Can you help me understand how this is going to further us on the, on the vision plan that we set together as a team? And then Michael's quiet here, right? Like, and if we don't have a good answer as to how that's going to further vision progress, if it's going to move us over to where we want to go, well, then should we really be spending effort on this if it's not going to move us towards our vision? No? Okay. 
All right. Just wanted to make sure. No, I think you're good. I think you're uh, you're yeah. on it. When you do this, some of the unintended consequence, and so one of my biggest regrets, I'm I'm really banging this drum throughout this year on kill distractions. One of my biggest regrets is that I only have empirical data for the last six months when I owned my MSP. We figured this out and said, hey, we can start doing this to, to eliminate some distractions about six months before I sold it. And so I saw it really reduce the amount of time I was having interruption. We had rolled it out to frontline management about two months. So I was seeing the start of the trend, but I can't tell you how much it reduces. I can't give you data on reduction which is why I'm saying, hey, take this, use it. All I would care about is if, if you find value from this, like reach out and ping me and say, hey, Ian, we did this. And wow, look at look at what happened in my, in my MSP. Or hey, guy, I, I used your thing and it sucks. It, it added more distractions to my world. Oh, okay, sorry, my bad. That's why I'm not charging anyone for it. <laughs> but Ian, when you, when it, you it, sold your MSP, was it acquired by another MSP that was rolling it up or was it somebody that had never been in the space but wanted in? No, I um, neither actually. So I sold it internally. Okay. So um, Doberman still exists today. My brother and I had been there from the start, but Mike had never wanted to sign on the line. So early on in the early days when we needed to take out things and, and put our name on paper and take on liability, I said, hey, do you want to do you want to sign on? And he said, no, I'd rather have the paycheck. You can, you can keep it. You can keep the equity. Just pay me, pay me fair and, uh, and I'll be good. And so he never wanted to sign on the line, but he and I always had that gentleman's accord that if I ever wanted to step out and say, Hey, I'm, I'm done that he gets first crack at it. I re reached out to him when I was, when I finally figured out, Hey, I'm, I think I'm done. I think I'd like to be done. And he said, yeah, let's do it. So we did an SBA 7A loan. As an aside, if anyone wants to try to sell to their team um, and is interested in that program, ping me. I'm more than happy to do a, here's how we do that. Here's how we, here's how we structured that, et cetera. I can introduce you to a guy who helped me run through it, who works throughout the country and just sherpas people through SBA 7A loans. So it's a really, really good vehicle um, for, a, uh, for a sale to your team. It can really help out. And so have you, have you had conversations oh. with your brother around, is he still seeing that same type of forward momentum with less distractions? Cause I mean, I got to assume that you're at least having dinner once a year. Yeah. You know, Mike and I do, we, um, we do talk the majority of where um, our conversations go is almost always around sales. So I'll be honest, I have not asked him about, Hey, like our distractions still under control. But he's got a he's got a pretty intimate, tight knit team, um, and yeah, I don't I don't know if Mike's getting distracted or not. Still, probably, I I would say he's probably still getting distracted. But I don't know if he um if he kept this moving forward or not. So I'll have to circle around and follow up with him on that. That's a good question for me to take back. Could be some more data for you. It could be some more data. What I'm hoping is that everyone here says, okay, I'm interested. I'd like to, I'd like to have a tool book or, or some sort of uh, methodology to do that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You don't have to figure out how to change all this stuff around. If you're interested in something, ping me, ping Michael. I've got a worksheet. It's five pages. It's pretty simple to, to run through on defining out, hey, I want to define out my mission, my vision, my core values. It'll walk you through that. And then the last page on it walks through, hey, how can I turn this into a one pager that my team can use to make good decisions all the way down to the front line. So happy to share that with anyone. And, and one of the things that I did see at Doberman and I have, I have observed with clients who have adopted this framework, decisions, good decisions can become rocket fuel. It can motivate teams. When your team can see, hey, this is how something that I decided to do impacts the company it, it impacts my organization and impacts the rest of my team and impacts my day in a positive way people get pumped when they can trace momentum back to actions that they directly took 
or that they empowered. So your frontline team, when they're making good decisions and it's getting high, like you're highlighting this in all staffs or in team meetings, whatever, what have you, people get pumped. They like to see like, oh, look, that, that was my thing. That was my idea. That was my call that I made. I made that call. I did that. I made that choice. And when they can see, hey, your choices have impact on our company, your choices make things better for all of us, that's a motivating factor. They can get enthusiastic when they understand, hey, here's how I can impact the company. When you tie in every single job role into that mission and vision and say, this is how you are furthering impact on our vision, you're a vital part. That's, that's closing the loop on your strategic plan. Too often mission, vision, values get defined and then get put in a binder and put up on a shelf. And you're making these something that should be part of a, a like a daily existence for teams. Marketing and messaging, like putting your values and your mission statement can attract like-minded clients. Michael was talking about, hey, when we met last year and started having some conversations around leadership, around mission, vision, values, and, and it really formed a connection, that's what can happen when you wear these out on your sleeve, so to speak, when you wear your core values as, as badges of honor, when you're saying like, no, this is why we exist. And you freely share that mission statement. You're weaponizing parts of your strategic plan. You're using them to forward pro project out. This is who we are and, and how we operate. And anyone who those statements resonates with will be attracted to your organization they'll be attracted to you they'll be attracted to your team just like just like a magnet that attraction kind of pulls them in and anyone who doesn't share your values or her your mission statement kind of does not resonate with it will repel them which will repel bad fit clients those bad fit clients will self-select out say this is not we don't want to do business with this organization. That's okay. It's much better to have them repelled out than to have them come in and find that tension after you've signed a contract with them. So, culture. Whenever you empower a team, you have less interruptions. You have less interruptions. It allows your managers to focus on opportunity versus problem solving. Opportunity is important stuff, problem solving is urgent stuff. And this is not a, a Ian thing, right? The, the godfather of modern management, Peter Drucker, said that the powerful manager will be the one who is focused on opportunity. That doesn't mean that your service desk manager is going out and closing new contract deals. It means that they see an opportunity to improve scheduling amongst their team. They find new efficiencies. They find new ways to raise productivity or to improve customer satisfaction or improve customer experience, that's a manager who's focused on opportunity versus, oh, we have this system down. Oh, we have this decision to make. Oh, we have this decision to make and bopping around, putting out fires. That's not the way a desk manager should be spending their time. That's not the way a project manager should be spending their time. That's not a way a network operations manager should be spending their time. They should be finding ways to make things better, faster, more profitable for the company versus fighting fires all day. When you have a, a culture of empowering people to make their own choices, that makes it so that the help desk tech, your frontline tech, your SOC analyst, doesn't feel that they're just a cog in a wheel, right? These are knowledge workers they're going to feel more impactful with you, with your team, with your company. I matter to my MSP. I am important at my MSP. I make impactful decisions every day at my MSP. That really does make the like not super fun job of working a help desk and getting yelled at all the day, all day and all night on the phone or via email. That makes it a little bit more enjoyable when they're able to make impactful decisions at their chair. How do you create these? 
I told you I'm, I'm going to give it all away. If you want the worksheets and stuff, just just ping me. I'm happy to happy to share those out. But define what your vision, mission, core values are, and then reverse engineer them into statements. Use close-ended yes/no type of statements whenever possible. You want this to be fast. So making good decisions, you also want to be able to make fast good decisions. So yes/no statements are great. Try to make sure that you're aligning all of your yeses and nos. So if you want yes to be the good decision and no to be the bad decision, every question needs to be framed that way. So does this honor our mission statement? Yes. Does it further progress towards our vision? Does, yes. Does it exist as a current how item on our vision statement? Yes. Is it in alignment with the core value of X? Is it in the alignment with the core value of Y? Test your questions against some decisions at your desk first. So use it at your desk and make sure like, hey, at the executive suite, at the leader, the, the, the tip of the spear suite, can I use this framework? Adjust it as needed. When you're saying like every decision that comes across my desk, I'm able to drop through this filter, shove it out to your managers have them start using it for all the decisions that bubble up against their desk. Your manager has the extra benefit qualifier of budget. Am I allowed to spend this budget? Yes, no. And if so, they're not gonna come and interrupt you for financial decisions anymore. You can start getting your managers to take ownership of those P&L lines that they're responsible for. After your managers have been using it for a while, engage your frontline staff and put it down there. You're going to need more guardrails with frontline staff than you do with a manager. So you can create those guardrails after you get through the filter set and say, hey, are you allowed to do this? Which would be, you know, like firing a client. Well, you probably don't want your help desk tech to say, <laughs> hey, sorry, Mr. Client, you're, you're done. So... You can give some you can give some filters in there, but if you've created good core values, it should probably eliminate out those sorts of decisions before it even gets down to that point. I'll tell you the one thing that we did, Ian, that was really powerful that talked about that, and I even adhered to this one myself, is we were trying to make sure that we could set good frameworks around who could spend money and how much money they could spend without asking for permission. And I even took it to myself. It's like, look, I want my CFO to be empowered. I want her to be capable, but I also want her to be successful. So I had to ask her, like, hey, how much money are you willing to allow me to spend without getting permission? And we said it. And she said, hey, you can spend a thousand bucks and I don't care. Now, don't go out there and spend 10 $1,000 transactions because obviously, but that gave me a framework of success that I didn't have to feel like, oh, I've got to go ask. And the other thing that it really did for me is when I went in and said, hey, I'd really like to go get a new backlit frame for our conferences, and it's going to cost us $7,000. The moment she oh. said yes, I never even thought about it. If I got a yes out of her, I immediately ran with it because I knew I didn't have to ask any further questions because if she said yes, I was good. Um, oh, yeah. and so it's been really powerful. I mean, like for a lot of the employees in the organizations to know that, Hey, if I've got to spend 500 bucks because I got to pick up a new piece of software or whatever it may be, if they've been authorized to do it, they just do it. And the amount of back and forth time that stops, I mean, yeah, that's, so that's that just 10 story. minutes, right? That was just a story for me that aligned with what you're saying here. And, you know, it, and I like to lead from the front. So I had to also put myself in check. You know, I just wouldn't want to go out there and do it and cause that drama for somebody else. So I, I like that idea a lot. One of the one of the big things that uh, and this like it's so interesting. So I went through I went through night school before undergrad. I went through a business school and it was a bachelor's of business administration. So BBA instead of an MBA. I don't have an MBA. I've taken countless business classes. I've taken countless other types of things, but in a management or business administration talk track, one of the few things that they don't really spend much time on is budget crafting. And when you look out at how to create budgets and all that, there's, there's a lot of real like big picture concepts and stuff, but the easy way to create a budget is saying, okay, would we spend last year? And that becomes the floor. 
what do we know that that's going to happen increases that becomes four plus what do we expect increases based off of growth so if we're you know if, if you grow expenses versus revenues if you know you have to have a 50 cent expense load for two dollars of revenue right that's a 25 percent gap well all right you can you can track that that becomes the next plus and then you give the slack you say hey hey tom you run this department and you've got a budget of 500,000 and then there's $20,000 of extra of slack that you can use for odds and ends expenses that aren't budgeted. Here's, here's your slack. But if you can create that figure and your, your team lead already knows, hey, here's my budget and here's my discretionary spend on top of my budget, that's where it's at. Someone comes in and, and Tom's got 20K worth of slack that he's allowed to spend over the course of the year for his team. And someone wants to spend 2000 of it. Well, you can make that call. Is it worth 10% of my slack for this un unaligned expense? Yes or no. And just create those guidelines for each bucket. And you can empower those, those leaders. I love that. Um, I love that using one of your leaders to rein in your own spending too like that's the the easiest way to get into financial trouble resides at the ceo's desk <laughs> when the ceo owns the company it's like yeah i'm just gonna go spend this money because i have this magic american express card and it's like no don't do that <laughs> don't don't do that don't do that boss don't do that ian please don't swipe the credit card over and over and over again so. Yeah, definitely one of the more powering and freeing movements that have ever happened in my life is when Jessica came to work here and took over as his role of CFO. And I just knew that it was being done right. And it was being done in ways that I could never get myself there. Um, I mean, I will, I will honestly say I truly sleep better at night, much better. Mm -hmm. And when she says yes, I know it's a solid yes. And so... Someone had mentioned um, repeating urgent versus important. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm just scrolling through some of the chats on here. But things that uh, I'm, my guess is this might have been around what, what is urgent is rarely important and what is important is rarely urgent. So things that, things that are urgent in a business are usually fighting fires. That's, that's daily items that's, that's in an MSP. These are tickets, these are down systems, these are upset customers, these are a bad, a bad review online, something like that. Those are urgent items that need to be dealt with on the floor. Urgent items are rarely important. Things that are important are usually improving the business, changing a system or a process. Um, hiring the next, the, the next member of the team things that are scheduled, you know when something important is happening, things that are urgent just drop out of the sky. And it's been found that people tend to deal with urgent things. People prioritize urgent things above important things when really it should be the other way. And the way you can fix that priority schedule for all of your most important resources, which should be your leaders and your managers and, and your higher level assets at the company, is by empowering other people to make good decisions for the important stuff that bubbles up. They shouldn't have to go get managerial approval to take the right action. Your process, your procedures that define how things get handled and your strategic plan can be used to handle the things that don't necessarily have those definitions or those call outs. Somebody was asking how they get a copy of this webinar. Um, it will go on our YouTube channel, just like all of the webinars that we do on a monthly basis. So if you haven't signed up for the Solutions Granted YouTube channel, please sign up. You'll get notifications. Even if there's something in the future that you don't have an opportunity to attend, you can always come back and look at it. Um, here's a good one, Ian. You said that you would give everybody the worksheet. So yeah. Do you want them to send us an email? Do you want them to email you? How would you like to communicate with those that would love to get a copy of that? Yeah, so if, if everyone, um, 
if everyone has uh, has has ran through and and they've been throwing out, I'm I'm assuming that Zoom kind of saves the chat log for you. Uh, it does, yeah. Okay, so if if you want to if you want a copy of it, just throw it in the chat. Michael's got the, all your information. Um, he and I can sync up afterwards, and then we will. Uh, I will get all of um, I'll get all the the people who said, "Hey, yeah, me, please," and we'll uh. We'll get it over to you. I will email it over to you. You'll have a, a personal email from me where I'll use your name and everything. <laughs> Dear F underscore name, bracket, bracket, semicolon. <laughs> Why do I feel like you have some automation for that, Ian? <laughs> no, it's it's actually, I mean, I will probably type up one thing and then do a little bit of copy pasting, but I'll, I'll old school this. I will send you all a personal email because none of you exist in my, uh, in my CRM yet, so. Yeah, you get you get a nice personally copy pasted email from from Ian. No, it'll be it'll be simple, and I'm I'm not a I don't sign people up for newsletters unless they ask to be signed up. So that's unless you say, hey, I kind of like what you're saying. I'd like to hear from you some for more often. You will not get a second email from me outside of, yeah, hey, here's the worksheet. Let me know if you have questions. So here's a really good one, and you know we got about. Yeah. What do we got about 10 minutes left? But this was a good question. It says, any helpful tricks on creating a mission statement that does not sound cliche? Uh, yeah, so first off, don't do it by yourself. Um, I'm a big fan of the, the more perspective you get in the room, the more robust a plan that gets developed. So get yourself and the key individuals from different verticals in your business. So someone who's really dialed into sales, Maybe someone who's dialed into net new sales and account management, if you're big enough to have those distinctions. Someone who understands the service team, someone who understands your network operations, your, your, your kind of proactive team, someone who understands the project team, someone who understands back office finance, yourself. If you have business partners, all the partners should be in the room. Um, get those people in a room, blank sheet of paper. I'm a big fan of nouns. So people place objects, things, verbs, Write out a bunch of write out a bunch of things about your company. Write out a bunch of like descriptors, actions, stuff like that. And then you wordsmith. You get the the person who's best at writing in the room helps kind of wordsmith stuff together. But you're answering the question of why you exist. So why does Solutions Granite exist? Why does Richardson and Richardson exist? Why does your company name here exist? and wordsmith out some options. So big, big whiteboard or a couple of big sheets of paper are the way to do this. So I wouldn't try to do this on a screen. I would get the people face to face, if at all possible, if you're a distributed company with people all over the globe, but hey, then Zoom it is. But if you can get some people in the room, it's so much better to have folks in the room. Don't try to do this right off the bat to so get the room jazzed up first, like get people talking to each other, get a little bit of, um, you know, do some opener exercises or icebreakers is, is the common um, the common phrase before you try to do a blank mission statement. So have the room already warmed up for 30 minutes to an hour before you try to tackle something like mission. That's some great advice there. And then, um, you know, what, what cannot happen is if you have a group of your professionals in the room, there is no way that you guys could sound cliche because your mission statement will reflect the room. The room will say it. Um, the other big thing that I would say is uh, don't use 20 words when 13 will do. So 13 is a magic number for a mission statement. Try to keep it 13 words or less. Otherwise, you're, you're making a mission paragraph or a mission essay. But it doesn't need to be that, like, don't, don't do that. Don't use huge, massive vocabulary words when you can use more simple words. Your mission statement should be able to be read to anyone, even someone who doesn't know your business. And they should go, I get it. I understand what you're doing. Like, I understand why you exist. It should clearly answer that question. Does that help? Advice. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Yep, I see the thank you. Cool. And I think, you know, and I don't think I've ever heard this before. Maybe I just haven't paid attention to it, but the 13 words. I think yeah. that's huge. I mean, because you've definitely seen, and I've seen it, I'm sure you've seen it. You've seen mission statements that 
do look oh, like a paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, you click like our mission and it, the whole thing's like a wall of text and your eyes go like that and you're like, yeah, no, next. Thanks. I'm, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Well, we've so got like about that. five minutes left. Um, any yeah. other questions, any comments? Um, hopefully everybody found this to be, obviously it's different. It's not something that we've done before. You know, I had put out that we were going to do things differently this year. Um, we were going to bring in other speakers. We're going to bring in other thought leaders. We're going to do some stuff that just wasn't about solutions granted talking about themselves or, you know, the next great thing that we were doing or thumping our chest because I don't think that really is helpful. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of that Wolf goes Wall on. Wall Street. <laughs> you see a lot of that goes on out there with a lot of vendors doing webinars and all they ever do is talk about themselves. And I think it needs to be a lot more about how can we enhance this community? How can we bring some knowledge and expertise? Man, I'm the first one to tell you, I got to surround myself with really smart people because I'm just not it. So I got Ian here today to make me look pretty. Oh, oh. <laughs> Well, thank you, sir. I, I appreciate uh, I pre Do you recommend reviewing mission? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So that's a that's a fan. That's a fantastic um, thing there. So when it when it comes to so we're talking, um, if you think about strategy and strategic management, management and organ management of an organization on a strategic basis. I recommend weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual cadence. On an annual basis, you're like there's no plan that can survive 12 months of action and still be valid. So every 12 months, you're going to have to modify and refresh or renew your plan. On a quarterly basis, you should be taking a day and measuring progress in a material way around your plan, as well as hey, like, is there enough stuff that has changed in our world that our plan might no longer be valid? So you should be challenging your plan on a quarterly basis. On a monthly basis, you should be reviewing every single part of your plan in an intentional way. And on a weekly basis, you should be honing in on the actions you're taking against your plan. So weekly basis, what did we get done last week? What do we anticipate to being done this week? What barriers or roadblocks do we do? How are we doing? Monthly basis, hey, what's the structure of our plan? So mission, vision, core values should be really visited and uh, reflected on in an intentional way. What's, what's an example? So core value, you know, carry your own bag. What's a great example of a frontline team member who carried their own bag in the past month? Let's highlight that. Let's let's go through and highlight some core value leaders. Let's highlight progress on vision. Let's reflect on. Uh, let's reflect on. Uh, no, I'm not from Canada, but I married. I married a Canadian. She's my favorite person <laughs> in the world. That's my import. I was waiting um, for it. <laughs> uh, what, what, you know, so so reflection on the on the various pillars of your plan should be uh should really happen on that monthly cadence um but whenever you get someone who like this 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 team member killed out killed a core value today right they killed it they lived our mission they killed they lived our values you should be highlighting and celebrating that and and that should come from leadership likewise if someone violates one of those that should be a private one-to-one -one discussion so praise public correct private so yeah, that's actually a really great way to end it. That was, uh, that was really great. Ian, I appreciate you, sir. Thank you for oh, spending an hour you, with friend. us and coming in and offering some of this fantastic knowledge that you have to share with everybody. And you know, I've appreciated it and uh, look forward to seeing you and your family tomorrow. We're looking to have a good weekend hanging out together. Super pumped. Hey, maybe we can finally get this cigar in my friend. I, I think we can make that happen. I think we, we, right, we got a few go. days this time to make it happen. And there's no work that has to be done. It's going to be, there's awesome. no work here. There's right. no work. We're just, we're, we're watching a, a series of left turns and I think they actually do two right in this one. So they make two there's, right turns. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know Ian and I, well, Ian's already there, but I'm heading up there with my kids tomorrow. We're going to see the NASCAR city street race that's happening in Chicago this weekend. And uh, yeah, it is a very unique experience because it's what 
eight turns or 11 turns or how many nine turns they've got yeah. in this particular race. And so, yeah, there's going to be some lefts and some rights. So it'll be very interesting to see. That's right. I know, uh, my daughter is most interested, not so much in the race, but uh, she's interested in seeing the chain smokers because they're performing. Oh, now. the that'll be that'll be a fun show. Yeah, that'll, that'll be a, a real show fun well. show. Yeah. All right, everybody. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. Um, we've got July fourth coming up next Tuesday, so please remember the essence of what that day is meant to be, the independence and celebration of this country. And if you've got some time, spend it with your family, appreciate one another and have an enjoyable day. Have a good one. All right, appreciate y'all.